Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, welcome to the Alternative Funding Models for Civic Projects panel. Um, it's great to see such a full room. We're going to get super cozy. Um, could we close the door, please? Thank you. So today, uh, we have three illustrious folks on this panel. And uh, myself, my name is Tiffany. I am one of the fellows this year with Code for America, working with the city of Charlotte. And uh, what we're going to talk about today is alternative funding models for civic projects. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce our, our three folks. We have uh, Rodrigo, um, who's from uh, Stanford as a doctoral researcher. We have Jace, who's CEO of Neighborly and also the co-captain of the brigade in Kansas City. And we have Rebecca, who is from the San Francisco Office of uh, Civic Innovation. So thank you very much. And uh, to kick it off, I'm going to give all three folks a chance to just introduce themselves, um, what, they're, what they've been working on, what they've been thinking about, and uh, do a bit of a presentation. Um, so Rodrigo, do you want to kick it off? Sure. Thanks, Tiffany. Um, thanks, everyone, for being here. Great to be with you. So we're going to be talking about you know, different ways of funding civic projects today. I'm going to talk about one slice of that that I've been working on for the past couple of years, um, which is civic crowdfunding. Um, and I'm going to give you a really quick overview, not going to get into the weeds of this, um, of some research that I've done um, over the past few years. Uh, let's try. OK, clicker's not working. No worries. Um, so first of all, I'm going to talk about the kind of field of civic crowdfunding, what I mean by this term. Um, and I'm going to tell you four things that I think we know or that we can say so far, two things we don't, and two very important questions. Um, and then come up with uh, four models of engagement. So if you're someone from a city, well, okay, this is great, this research, but how do I use it? I'm going to suggest four possible ways that you can do that. So I think most people in the room probably know what crowdfunding is um, and the fact that it's being used for a whole range um, of different projects. The numbers are pretty big, um, and I think an interesting number within this is the donation platforms, the kind of pledge reward kind of things like Kickstarter and Indiegogo, those globally are huge right now. Um, I'm having some issues with the formatting, apologies. Um, but what, is, what happens when you apply that kind of methodology to uh, projects that provide a service to a community, um, that provide some kind of public or, or shared good? Well, I've been calling this civic crowdfunding. Um, the structure is pretty similar to, to most types of crowdfunding, although you'll see kind of on the left here, there's a bit of a bigger range of actors involved. And of course, the output is a community service, which is quite different from, say, a Pebble Watch or something like that. And for those of you who've been in government or studied kind of um, public goods at some point in your life, um, I'm not going to pretend this is new either. People have been getting together to produce public goods in lots of innovative ways for centuries. Um, there is a case study that I love to talk about, which is the funding of the platform on which the Statue of Liberty stands, um, which was funded by a campaign by Joseph Pulitzer in, in a newspaper, The New York World, in 1885, and it has a lot of similarities with crowdfunding. But let's fast forward to the present then. Um, kind of what are people using civic crowdfunding for, in case you, you, ha you haven't come across this field at all yet? Well, they're doing things like building community centers. This is one in South Wales. They're funding bike share schemes. This was funded on Neighborly. And uh, they're building public pools in New York City. And this field has really come together in about the last 10 or 12 years. And we see the kind of acceleration of it here, 2008, um, 2009, with the rise of Indiegogo and Kickstarter. They popularized this model of crowdfunding. And since then, we've seen an explosion in the number of civic platforms. So Neighborly, a very important one. Space Hive in the UK, Citizen Investor in the US. Brickstarter as well. And another thing that's important is we've seen a kind of model emerge for how you do this. Um, if you're going to run a platform, the most typical way to do it right now is to charge people about a 5% platform fee. There's fees for payment processing. You make that campaign time limited. And you make a choice about, is this going to be an all or nothing kind of fundraising campaign? Or are you going to let people kind of keep the money even if they don't reach their target? And I put that out there just to say that you know, this is a movement to, to try and get things done. It's also a business model, and we need to keep those two things in our minds. So what I did to try and make sense of, of this field and all the, the, the wide number of platforms that exist was to put together a data set of projects between 2010 and 2013. And so the conclusions that I'm going to tell you about are based on that. Um, there are about 1,200 projects, and there's a few more details there. Um, and the platforms, the projects I looked at, kind of neatly split into two. 
platforms that just do civic projects, so Neighborly, SpaceHive, IOB, Citizen Investor, and then the kind of generic platforms that have a lot of civic projects on them. So Kickstarter being, being the biggest of those, Catarse is in Brazil. And what I found, and this is, the, this is one of the things that we know, is that um, civic platforms that are specifically catering to, I guess, our kind of audience, I think I can say that, um, are small, but they're growing. And they're also, uh, it seems, more successful than your average kind of generic platform. So if you look at the success rate of civic projects on Kickstarter, this is, typically 81% of them reach their target. If you know anything about crowdfunding, that's a really surprising number because the average success rate across categories is about 45%. You're measuring money yeah, reaching the target. So on Kickstarter, if you don't reach your target, you get nothing. And so there's a pretty clean measure of success. And thanks for bringing that up because the definition of success can be slippery. But in this case, there's a very clean kind of yes, no. Another thing that we know, though, is that while we might remember from, say, Kickstarter, you know, the Veronica Mars or Spike Lee or these huge projects, most <coughs> crowdfunding projects and most civic projects are really small. 86% um, raise less than $20,000. And that's really significant when we're thinking about what can we use this for? What's the right scale? Another thing I want to point out is um, it's geographically very concentrated. So you see uh, a lot of civic projects in these states, the green states. Um, and the rest, it's very sparse. And what are people, what are the kinds of projects that people are doing? Well, the most popular category that I could find by far was gardens and parks, closely, f or not really that closely followed by events. And so what we get is the emergence of a kind of typical civic crowdfunding project at this moment in time. And I would say it's this. It's a community farm in Philadelphia that serves an underserved community. They raise $2,000 from 45 donors, and the organization doing it are already an established nonprofit. So this is the most common thing that you see coming up. So if you want to do civic crowdfunding right now, this would be the easiest way to do it. And so I'm not going to go, there's, a, there's 150 pages of this research if you want to know a bit more about some of those details. Um, there's also a blog post uh, which summarizes it. So if you want to check that out in more detail, um, you know, feel free to go to one of these places. So I just want to quickly sum up the four things that I think we know about civic crowdfunding. So the first thing is that it's small scale. It's very small scale, but there are big kind of ambitions for the field. Secondly, it started as a kind of garden and park hobby, um, but large organizations are starting to get involved. And I'll talk about that in, in a second. Thirdly, it's very concentrated in cities. And fourthly, um, it's very skewed in terms of the distribution. So you have... What do you mean expressly So uh, the, the, the places where civic crowdfunding platforms have their headquarters. So that would be Kickstarter in New York, Indiegogo in San Francisco, Neighborly in Kansas City, um, Citizen Investor in Tampa, Florida. Um, and the, the fourth thing, which I kind of alluded to with that graph, that kind of long tail, is you get this really skewed distribution of what's happening right now. So you have a few very big winners and lots of much smaller ones. Now, okay, two things that, that I don't know, two things that I really could not answer from this research um, and that I think are really important for us to think about. Firstly, will uh, civic crowdfunding deter governments from investing in these services in the long term? So if we prove that the crowd can finance this stuff, well, why do we need government to fund them? Maybe we should just close the Parks and Rec Department because we don't need it anymore. And secondly, um, as this field kind of expands away from these sort of smaller projects and we go to bigger projects, will it be that richer communities where there's more expertise and resource, we'll just be a lot better at taking advantage of this. And we'll see crowdfunding essentially just reproducing or maybe exacerbating the inequality that we already have. And honestly, the data that we have right now in civic crowdfunding just isn't good enough to answer either of these questions. But I think as public servants, they're incredibly important ones for us to consider. So where do we go from here? Um, well, as I said, I think we need much better data. And I think it's incumbent on um, platforms. It's also incumbent on potential users of platforms. So government, foundations, uh, sort of civic hackers who say, you know, I want to get involved in this, but I'm not sure whether it's good or bad. I don't have any analytics. 
you can be part of the pressure for better data. And secondly, I think we need kind of socially grounded research. We need to actually talk to people about how they're using it. Uh, my project was a very sort of early first step on this, but I'm hoping over the next few years to be doing a lot more of that. So if you're a city person, you're thinking, okay, this academic came and gave a talk, you know, so what? What am I going to do with it? Well, I want to tell you that if you are um, a city, um, there are four ways that you could potentially build an interface between you and this sort of weird world of civic crowdfunding that's out there. The first is to just be, and this is the most light touch way of doing it, just be a curator. So New York City has a Kickstarter page um, in which they just curate the projects that they like. They don't invest in them, they don't back them, they just say, I'm shining a light on something good that's relevant. Second way you can do it is actually run your own campaign. Uh, this is the city of Chicago. Uh, raised money for um, a basketball program for inner city um, youth, and it just put up a page on Indiegogo. Just did one campaign, hasn't done any other since, but is very successful, raised sixty two thousand dollars. And so, yeah, sorry, sure. The Chicago Parks Foundation, which is a five hundred one c three linked. That's correct, yeah. But you had, the mayor was the, the front of this campaign. So the, the entity receiving the funds was, was separate, which is significant, but it was very much a kind of a city campaign. Great questions, by the, by the way. These are all very, very relevant. Um, third way that you can, you can potentially uh, sort of engage with crowdfunding is to kind of um, facilitate it. So uh, this isn't a government example, but Khan Academy uh, gives all of its employees uh, a set amount of money each week, and this is down to their interns, to crowdfund coders that they like. There's a platform called GitTip where you can give recurring donations um, to uh, software developers, open source software developers. And Khan Academy said, well, this is a great project. How can we sort of put our scale behind this? Um, and I think there are a couple of ways that cities might take on this model. One could be to say that there are discretionary funds that we're going to allow people to vote on how they're spent, and almost a kind of participatory budgeting. Um, and there are plenty of other ways, too. And then the fourth way, and this is the most ambitious model. Um, I've seen RFPs that want to do this, so maybe we'll see this sooner than I thought. Um, the fourth way would be to actually build your own civic crowdfunding platform. This example is IBM. Um, some researchers said, uh, within IBM said, you know, can we source better innovation across this vast corporation if we allow people to propose projects and compete for funding? And they had some pretty good results out of it. Um, and there may, be, there may be cities, I think there are cities among us who want to build their own platform and say, okay, we're going to put our projects up and see how, how people vote. And if you want to see those four models, um, I'm going to be publishing an article really soon in what's well, going to be a great book um, about cities and, and open innovation. And if you are really interested, I'd be really happy to share a draft with you. So thanks for listening and really looking forward to the discussion and questions. Oh, was there a question there? So is the crowdsourcing funding regulated or audited or any type of oversight through any type of GASB standards or OMB to make sure that the money is being directed to the cause? It is completely unregulated at this moment in time. Um, Investment-based crowdfunding will soon be regulated by the SEC. This type of donation-based is not at all. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to have all the presenters present first and then make sure to write down your questions so you can remember them and we Hold can on. engage all Thanks. the questions together as a final question. Well, could I get a quick round of applause for Rodrigo's silky smooth <laughs> accent? Uh. So from a silky smooth uh, British accent to sort of a Midwestern twang. I'm Jace Wilson from Kansas City. I think so, yeah. That's the one. And this is our first time doing a slideshow presentation, so bear with us as we figure it out. Uh, and Rodrigo uh, mentioned a couple of times neighborly in his research. Uh, and it, it, that's because we've been around for two and a half years as a donation-based civic crowdfunding platform. Uh, but from the get-go, the, from the outset, the initial conversation that led to Neighborly was between uh, myself, a civic geek, um, and a bond trader over breakfast sandwiches in downtown Kansas City, Missouri. And it was about uh, why are all of the other capital markets being rewired by peer-to-peer -peer and crowdfunding 
uh, and not municipal securities. This $400 billion a year uh, segment that is the lifeblood of financing uh, places. Uh, so we said, we'll, we'll go ahead and do that. And then we started out, and then a week later we realized, wait, we can't do that yet. Uh, we weren't ready as people, we weren't ready as a market, and we didn't have the resources. So we said, what can we do? So we built a donation-based crowdfunding platform that has served in the order of 40-some-odd community projects to this point. It's raised a few million dollars for these projects, and we're very grateful for the chance to have done that. Um, and we also are very excited about uh, getting ready to release the uh, new model. And the new model is around municipal bonds. Uh, show of hands, anybody not familiar with bonds? I threw, this, I threw this slide in uh, as part of this investor deck that we put together because we had enough investors to say, Wait, what? A municipal bond. And so just for anyone that isn't familiar, it's the way that we fund some of our nation's greatest treasures. It's the way that we fund uh, operations in cities. And it used to be a part of civic life. Um, it was as much a part of civic life as voting. So it was something that if we wanted to build a project, we would get together as a community, we would rally the troops, so to speak, we would put it on the front page of a newspaper to, to make it a call to action as something that you do. Uh, and the problem that we're addressing at Neighborly is that it's become too hard to invest in communities through those traditional means. And I'm going to breeze through this stuff. If you, just stop me afterwards if you want to know more. But part of the challenge is that there's extraordinarily high fees involved in this marketplace. Um, right now, municipal bonds have about double the fees of corporate bonds, which makes zero sense from a risk profile perspective. Uh, there's something else systemically wrong, though, when the people that are making lots of money uh, selling bonds to the, health, the wealthy folks who can still afford them, calling for a ground-up overhaul of their own industry, there's something structurally at play. Um, this is part of the challenge. Um, it used to be something where we would just go to the courthouse steps and bust out our checkbook. It's become a process that's uh, been to about stepping on any toes, uh, taken over by very large banks. And those banks, have, you know, the real action of this slide is out here in the 80s with the deregulations and the consolidation. Um, hundreds of banks collapsed into dozens and then into basically four. Um, and these are four of the five top underwriters. Um, and there's an underwriter in almost every transaction. That used to be cool when it was like a mom and pop savings and loan down the street in the community where the capital is being deployed. Uh, but it's a very different process, and it's, it's a very different set of dynamics in the flow of capital when those banks are all located in, in one, on one street. I will not name that street. Um, <laughs> there's also the challenge of intermediation and uh, the number of middle layers that we've placed between the issuer of the municipal securities and the investor in the municipal securities. Uh, without getting into too many details, this part of our model is to sort of uh, help bring that back to a natural relationship between the issuer and the investor. It is not at all an innovation. It's not a new idea. It's, in fact, using technology uh, to get back to a way that we used to do things where the financing of civic projects and civic goods was a part of the, the civic way of life. And another part of our solution is that we roundly reject the, the language that's been incorporated to describe the, the role of people in investing in places. Uh, if you ask somebody who sells municipal securities uh, to name people in their transactions uh, as compared to, say, very large insurance companies or mutual funds, they'll call them retail. Uh, and one of our starting points is that we say, no, we're going to reject that and we're going to say we're, they're people. Um, and it works, as Rodrigo pointed out, several really good examples of the donation-based crowdfunding. It works in a very similar way where uh, you can go and find the projects that you're interested in, uh, something within the 50-mile radius of the Bay Area or something that involves sports or something that will return above a certain percentage uh, annual yield. Uh, whatever your criteria, you'll be able to find projects that you can invest in and not just donate. And uh, in theory, it's this sort of win engine that uh, these communities can get a little more money out of their deals. The investors can earn a little more money, and then the communities can get jobs and amenities in the process. And to, to frame it in the reference for scale, uh, even though uh, retail, aka people, have sort of become the minority of the municipal securities market, still people every single week, uh, as of last year, buy more bonds each week than Kickstarters raised in its entire history. So to put that in that, at the scale perspective. Will it work? We have absolutely no clue. Um, 
we're in the wonderful 500 startups right now, figuring that out and getting ready to uh, deploy it out to the market. Um, but we did get a, a bit of an early indication from the city of Denver, who kind of let the cat out of the bag a bit and did this uh, mini bond issuance, which was retail facing, right? So they wanted people in their transaction and they said, we want 12 million bucks and we'll do it in three days. And uh, they sold out in an hour. Uh, and we had a couple of conversations with some of their folks and figured out that it was actually closer to 23 minutes. But uh, yeah, I think it'll work. But more importantly than what happened there is what happened afterwards. Oh, I was going to say, how many people? Like, do you know how many investors? Yeah, a, a couple of thousand investors in that one. But uh, th they limited the amount that you could buy to 20,000. Yeah. Uh, but more important than the raise itself is what happened afterwards. You start seeing uh, conversations around it on say, on my Facebook feed, folks that would never talk about public finance, the, the role that public finance plays. And this is like a bike advocacy group that has relied to date on donations uh, to build out bike infrastructure in, in Kansas City, Missouri. And here they are talking about how, hey, we could use this to build the cycle tracks that we want. So I think more important than the, the proving the point that you know, people can uh, invest in these things and will invest in these things, given the means and the reasons to do so, is the, the effect that it has when you remember that the financing, the sort of the last kilometer of, of building out a civic project uh, should be as much a part of the, the process as voting or the design charrette. And so our goal over the next three years is to help a thousand communities raise a billion. Sounds crazy from the perspective of a donation-based platform that's been around for two years and has raised two million for projects, but maybe not so crazy when you put it in the perspective that Lending Club earlier this year surpassed the $5 billion mark in loans originated through peer-to-peer, -peer, a model that didn't exist five years ago. Uh, that's all. Thank you. So I was negatively or positively peer pressured into having a slide deck. Um, by these guys. Sorry. And it is, I am a recovering investment banker and I try not to do PowerPoints anymore and it doesn't look nearly as good as theirs. Um, so I'm Rebecca Foster and I work in the mayor's office here in the city of San Francisco and prior to that was, uh, was an evil person selling municipal bonds um, to, to investors uh, it, working with uh, Florida and uh, Georgia and Louisiana doing a lot of hurricane catastrophe related financing on the East Coast and then working out here, uh, working with the UC system and a lot of public utilities and states along the West Coast f funding unemployment insurance deficits and a number of other priorities. And now I'm working in the mayor's office uh, and doing strategic finance around social impact bonds and workforce housing uh, are, the, are the primary initiatives. So Jace gave a great overview, brief overview of the muni market. Um, just a few other things, I think, contextually. So the tax-exempt bond marketplace is there are currently $3.7 trillion of municipal bonds outstanding. And that's from about 20 billion when municipal bonds first started being, when tax exemption was enacted by the federal government in 1945. And for governments and nonprofits, this is, it's basically viewed as a low cost and long term way to access capital for a whole number of, for long term projects and also for general fund priorities that you might need to front load that, you might need upfront capital that then you want to pay back over a long period of time. For investors, it's a highly regulated, viewed as a pretty safe, transparent, liquid, tradable place where this is, if I, I am the city, can get 30-year $30, 30 financing from a municipal bond, but an investor can actually trade that in the marketplace, so they're not investing for, they don't, they're not, their capital is not tied up for 30 years, and that's pretty important, get, being able to get long-term financing. And because of, t because of tax exemption, and also because these are pretty secure investments, what we're paying as a city on these types of bonds is maybe three or 4% interest rate. And investors are getting that interest, but they're getting it with tax exemption federal from federal income taxes and then from local income taxes. Um, if it's a local, if they're in the state of California and it's a California bond. So the reason this was created uh, is so that state and local governments could access capital and basically get 
subsidies for large local and regional projects without the federal government directly subsidizing them. So the IRS and our taxes are basically subsidizing investments at the local level in local infrastructure through tax exemption. And it's a very fundamental driver of local economies. So in the recession, the most recent, in um, 2009, with the stimulus bill, one of the big pieces of it was the creation of a much bigger Build America bond uh, portfolio that basically allowed governments to issue taxable bonds, which meant that now global investors would be interested in buying them, not just U.S. investors. And then the federal government gave a direct payment back that was the tax-exempt portion, the 40% of that taxes to the government. And that was a huge, huge basic injection of jobs and construction and building and for local governments because they all started and universities, they tapped into that market to issue a number of bonds in that period. Um, so that's we will get into the discussion about where is the right place for different financing tools. What I'm really focused on is this market exists that I used to work in that is, I think, pretty highly functional for investing in real capital and infrastructure projects and big priorities where you actually have an asset that you're financing against. It is not as good and it's much more difficult as governments to actually invest in human capital. And so to invest in preventative, a little bit more money upfront up front in prevention and preventative services than down the line in remediation. So to invest more in preventing people from going to the hospital versus ER visits, or preventing people from getting to prison versus the high cost of prisons. And that is, that's really hard. And so I think one of the things we're thinking about is how do we actually create a marketplace that values health and well-being. And markets need supply, demand, a market infrastructure, and an enabling environment. So we need investors that care about these things and that, can, that think about them in the right way. We need, we need actually on the demand side, and then we need great service providers that can actually deliver these types of human capital improvements. And we need Somebody mentioned GASB and accounting standards. You need, we need some transparency and some, an enabling environment and a lot of talent in the area that actually creates an infrastructure for this to be a functioning market. Um, that uh, will allow this, the creation of a broader marketplace. And then I think the other important distinction is that investment is not actually revenue. So getting funding upfront capital is not, does not actually mean that you have the dollars to pay something back. And so revenue is actually savings down the line like from a government's perspective. Are we saving money by investing upfront in fetal maternal health care for the first year of a low-income mom's life? What are the, th our revenue from that upfront investment might be that we are actually saving money in five years because we're spending less on special education, we're spending, we're losing less dollars for kids not being in school, we're building fewer, fewer prisons, which, um, you know, th those sorts of things, that's a revenue source, that, but the difficult part is how do we actually raise capital against that revenue source? And so that's where one of the things that we're looking at in San Francisco and other cities and states have, are, have looked at is um, pay for success and social impact finance. And so at a very high level, what pay for success is, is performance-based contracting for social interventions where we as the government pay only if a successful outcome is achieved. And Performance-based contracting has existed in governments. One thing that's a little bit different about this is this is not, this is not, this is exactly, it's not as prescriptive. This is exactly how do you have to provide these services. It says, we care about these results. Now go be innovative and flexible and figure it out, social service provider, how to get us these results. We don't want people to go back to prison at the levels that they're going back to. And so go figure out the best way to do that. And then the social innovation finance piece bridges this timing gap. So we, as government, 
it's really hard for us to redirect these dollars to prevention because we're spending a lot right now on emergency rooms and prisons and all of these remediation. They're, they're expensive and we can't stop funding them. We can't stop funding the things that, you know, we, and just like divert all of our money to early childhood education, for example. But if we can actually say, well, if in five years we start to save money because we've invested up front, then we'll pay this back. And so the social impact finance is that working capital loan that basically provides the upfront financing to enable us to, to enable the social service provider to scale up and provide the intervention that we would then pay back if and only if those outcomes are achieved. So I want to move on to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. So we've heard of a plethora of different options and alternatives to kind of traditional conservative funding mechanisms. And what I'm curious about is that there's this huge breadth of scale from the micro kind of intervention project that's a garden or a park in your neighborhood to these large infrastructural projects that Rebecca was mentioning um, with social impact bonds. And I'm just curious um, for, I think a lot of folks in this room probably have a project in mind that they're thinking about trying to finance or fund. What is the criteria that one should consider before figuring out which type of alternative to jump into? Um, I mean, I would say kind of look at what has succeeded, what kind of scale has succeeded. So for the sort of donation-based crowdfunding, um, you know, don't try and do a $2 million project. Uh, you could be the first success, but there's a good chance that you won't be. Um, but if you, if you want to do something small scale, I think that's a great way to go. Um, and I think you know, these guys could speak more to the multi-million dollar places. Yeah, I think there's also a question about who actually should be funding these priorities? Should government be funding things, right? If, if, this, if this is, there's a big priority, then why isn't government just spending the money on it right now? And so I think there, in addition to a size question in terms of how much money needs to be raised, there's a question of this you know, public versus private funding. And I think that's one of the things that comes up with social impact finance. How I think about it is that it's hard for government to take risk. And if it can, and it's easier for the private sector and private capital to take that risk a little bit. And so if something is a little bit more innovative and a little bit riskier, and it's not as clear that it will be successful, but it's a high priority, then that might be a good place in this, you know, for us to try a different approach to solving homelessness that we think is gonna work, but we're not 100% sure it's gonna work. And if it does work, then after the five-year financing is done, then government absolutely should be paying for that on an annual basis. And so I think that that's another piece to consider is this continuum of when, who's taking the risk when, and when is the, you know, which capital is the best for different levels of risk. I've got a question uh, to follow up on that, which takes me to two. One is, you get the gentleman in the middle, your name is? Jace. repeat the question for everyone um, it's around how projects are registered with the government how do they know about them and second of all what legal advice um, should one consider when embarking on a project great questions uh, question. as Rodrigo mentioned the in the let's look at this as a continuum from the donation based uh, civic crowdfunding 
up to these uh, extremes for mega scale infrastructure and then uh, social impact finance in the, in the mix. Uh, when we're talking about civic crowdfunding as a donation proposition, um, I don't know how they get registered with the government and it might not necessarily be a government as the end recipient. Uh, in a lot of the cases on Neighborly, we've seen 501c3s that are civic in nature, uh, being sort of the, 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 the owners, uh, for lack of a better term, of the project. Um, and you know, so there's been mention of like, how, is this, uh, how are people protected? How are we making sure the funds are getting used right? As Rodrigo mentioned, that's uh, basically unregulated at this point. Uh, we're just starting to see models from, say, Kickstarter, uh, starting to look at uh, donor protections that allow for you know, clawback provisions that say, if you're not going to use it the way you said you were going to use it, then I should get my money back, or, or at least part of it. Um, but then up, up this spectrum, this continuum into the world of municipal securities, the, what we were talking about, uh, you're entering into a completely different domain that's, uh, there, it's a registered security that you're purchasing, um, and it's passed through months or years of, of, uh, of political and, and legal vetting and, and preparation, and the final sort of seal of approval is from a bond council, a lawyer that's sort of putting the reputation on the line saying, I've looked at the 600, I wrote the 600 page prospectus and I've reviewed everything in it and uh, these are the facts and this project is, is what it says it is and there are uh, life cycle mechanisms in place that, that track with the funding in those cases, so. It's also, it's a really big question just with the Jobs Act in general with, as you make the transition from a donor-based crowdfunding type yeah. platform to an investment-based platform, is what level of accredited investor do you have to be and if there's, I mean, they're figuring that this is an open question across these platforms right. with investing in consumer products and a lot of, and I could see as it evolves in this area too, that there's a ton of regulation that exists and it actually is to protect investors and it hasn't always done a good job of that, but it is, you know, and so I think it's, that's a difficult question that we need to figure out because I would be nervous. I I would be nervous sure. about investing in a local project if I'm saying, oh, I'm spo well, supposed to get ten percent money back even, or whatever. Not even investing, but if you just post it on the city's website, this is a great project and it has some outside un, un, unfamiliar or innovative funding mechanisms. People would want to know well, what 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 legal quagmire, if any, am I in the city getting into? By yeah. Right. So I, mm. I can see there's some burning questions in the audience. I'm going to um, allow everyone to speak. So did you have a question? Yes, I, I'm going to lobby one shot as all of you so I don't say another word. But So on the crowdsourcing or crowdfunding piece, I have some experience. What we found in our limited research and experience is typically you have more success when your institutional governments aren't heading up. Mm -hmm. um, people tend to invest more when a value stream is plus and they're mobilized to help out. Uh, and, and so I was wondering how the New York City Council putting it up on their website, how there's any uh, evidence of any success with that. And I will say it is regulated, because if, if the community, any community, you know, whatever state you're in from Massachusetts, any fund coming to a conduit to the city, and those are audited. Uh, we have certain, we have, you know, gap fee standards and other standards we have to abide by. And then on the, um, a very interesting presentation by both on the, um, on the finance piece, but it, would you agree or disagree that still, it is obviously dependent on your ability to pay, or you need to get, depending on your credit rate, on your bond rate, to go a different route for the bond. I mean, you still have to, in Massachusetts, I assume here as well, you would have to get authority to borrow for that social cause or that innovation regardless. Mm -hmm. And then how we are able, to, if we're able to borrow creatively, as you as you, as you both suggested, um, we'd have to see what marketplace yields the best return for us as well. Yeah, I mean, I think one one point that you raise is that I mean, this is all this is all debt we're talking about, and so it is all based on it's going to be paid back. This is unless it's a donation, and it, and that's what a lot of the crowdfunding platforms are right now. Is like you're just raising the money to, and and it, it is not an investment; it's a full donation. But otherwise, these are. This is debt, and so the rate that you pay on that debt will be should be commensurate with the risk of the payback. In the case of the social impact finance, they're called bonds often, which is a misnomer. They're not really bonds in the same way as as muni bonds or other bonds. They're actually 
It's actually more like a working capital loan, and it's not the government that is taking out the loan. It's actually an intermediary, and it's the service provider that needs that working capital loan in order to scale up the services to provide the outcomes that the government will then pay back. So the government is the back-end payer of the financing, and so the rate that is being paid on that financing is going to be dependent on what the investment banks and the philanthropic organizations that are investing, how likely they think it is that the government's going to pay it back, which they'll do a lot of diligence on, and how likely they think it is that the service provider will deliver those successful results. Yeah, just to pick up on, on your question, so the point about, you know, is it good for a government to be front and center, or, or is that just scare people away? Um, you know, I think that is very, very context dependent, right? So I think there are some, some cities like Chicago found that putting, you know, Rahm Emanuel on the front of that Windy City Hoops campaign seemed to help. Um, you know, maybe there are mayors, uh, maybe if Rob Ford, you know, was the front of a crowdfunding campaign. <laughs> also what you're funding, right? <laughs> um, like I'm sorry? Also what you're funding. If it's the mayor saying, right. like, help us fund our park, you might have people say, like, don't our tax dollars fund that? Right. But if you have the mayor saying, fund this great after-school program, there might be... Right, right. And, if, hmm. if it's that elected official, if I'm not having done this, that's one thing to campaign for. Mm -hmm. Our experience in terms of donors for certain causes, going into the city coffers versus mm -hmm. going into that neighborhood that needs a mobile farmers market or that particular nonprofit. It, 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 I mean, we've seen some distinguished results. So I think we're going to jump to another question. Um, Jeff, you have your hand. Um, so this is a question for Jake primarily, but anyone else is free. Um, have you seen, and I think this is a little bit what we're asking, have you seen any difficulties in implementing uh, the projects that have been funded? Uh, specifically with regard to, say, city regulators coming in and saying you actually can't build a cycle track right there because that hasn't gone through a variety of uh, neighborhood yeah. uh, associations and whatever approval processes? That, excellent question. So that gets to the, sort of the, the cultural differences of these two paths of a donation-based sort of uh, smaller scale uh, mechanism that's in the civic realm that's led by 501c3s, uh, neighborhood groups, and so forth, versus uh, this tried and true process of, uh, of, of issuing municipal securities, which has to go through a political process. There has to be the approvals. You know, basically funding in that case is the last kilometer of figuring everything out and getting the, the project implemented. Um, so yes, to answer your question, yes, there have been uh, a couple of challenges where you know, we've had to, uh, early on we implemented a thing when we were a donation platform. We have to get at least a, an MOU from your city or whatever the governing body of relevance is that says that they not only uh, give you permission, but they support your effort. That it's like proactive, that, that they're willing to say that this is okay. Uh, that weeded out, you know, we were getting like a dozen applications a week from people saying, I, I would really like to have like a giant swing set uh, in my, on my sidewalk or whatever, uh, versus like it narrowed out to projects that had, you know, legitimate backing from the appropriate entity. But that is one thing uh, that we're really excited about with the evolution of, of bringing the principles of crowdfunding and the mechanics of peer-to-peer -peer into the municipal security space is that it is going into the process that exists. It's going into the, the civil and the democratic process. And it's something that, you know, a decision about putting in a new cycle track had to have passed through all of the necessary uh, checkpoints. And at the end, uh, it's something that can be financed uh, to a large extent through the community. I'll just chip in there. I mean, more robust models can and are being built. So Space Hive, which is a UK-based platform that I worked for for a bit before I started this research, you know, has a process where you can put up a project as an idea and as you get particular approvals from the city, um, it, you know, it, it will, its state will change, essentially. And, and it only becomes open for fundraising once it has all of the necessary permissions. And if this, the city turns around and says, look, there needs to be a consultation process, well, then that has to play out, and the thing can't, can't raise. There's also an interesting, there's a, a large local developer is working on a process using a crowdfunding idea where you basically part of trying to get people to come out at the planning department and really pound the table for your development is that they are a piece of the investment in it. So you, you get the local folks who are around your proposed development who are crowdfunding a small piece of it, and then that increases their level of buy-in. So by the time you have to go get the permits, you have a much broader and a different base who 
are usually the NIMBYs who are not in favor of what you're doing, but actually are now investors in it. Yeah. So are these projects being, their fees are being waived, or their in-kind services being provided by the jurisdiction, or is the city actually benefiting from these projects and making money off of these projects by charging those fees and services that they normally do for any other private if you're talking about donation platforms, the fees are going to the companies. They're not going to the cities because cities don't own platforms. Um, but, you know, anecdotally, uh, you know, there are a lot of deals that are cut, um, you know, uh, to, to do. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, even outside of the government space, I know a lot of large nonprofits that go to, you know, the two biggest crowdfunding platforms and, and get preferential treatment. Um, and I think, you know, governments who are smart would kind of, would recognize that and would probably need to negotiate. Yeah, there's, there's some uh, gray area that, uh, the adjacent field of participatory budgeting, uh, 1970s Porto Alegre, Brazil, uh, coming into fashion now in the United States. Uh, we start to see early examples of it with even like uh, sort of what seem like maybe token gestures of open checkbooks that you can rearrange the, the line items and say how much you would spend on each thing. Uh, it, it gets back to a concern that Rodrigo addressed early on, which is something that we've thought a lot about at Neighborly from the get-go is, uh, how do you prevent that type of uh, direct access to the budgeting process uh, from uh, the end game of wealthy enclaves, um, sort of just who have access to the technologies and the processes and understand you know, all the mechanisms at play, uh, how do you prevent them from sort of stacking the chips uh, in their own backyards? And I think we should be real that they already do that, <laughs> yeah. by the way. Um, it's, yeah, yeah, that's you know, it may be a slightly different enclave that is more technologically literate, but you know, wealthy communities are excellent at advocating for their interests in, in our cities. And you know, that is the cause of so much historical inequality. Um, but to your question, um, I think that um, demonstrating demand for something in these kind of new areas that perhaps government hasn't thought about can be really valuable. Like, do I think that, you know, every project should be a kind of free-for-all of we need to demonstrate support or it won't happen? No, but I think in areas where, you know, government maybe doesn't have the time or the resource to think, oh, let's do a park in this area, maybe government just didn't think about it. This can be a great way to surface that idea and say, hey, have you considered X? And, you know, this thing which you didn't have time to even look into, we can show you that there are like 2,000 people that think it's a great idea. So I think it works as a kind of more of a tactical intervention than, than you know, for every project. And related to that, what would a process like that look like? In your opinion, I mean, what would that feedback loop look like in terms of the government being able to decide what types of projects in which um, the, that community would be in favor of as opposed to just guessing? Or... Um, it would look like, um, you know, uh, say, a community organization in, in a neighborhood, let's just take, I don't know, Bayview, San Francisco, says, you know, uh, chronic underinvestment in this part of the city. We think that people in this neighborhood really value green space. We have an idea to do it. Here's a disused piece of land. Uh, we raise some money to get, to get that, that piece of land, um, uh, you know, developed to a sort of minimum level. And folks from the city government who are savvy about the ecosystem are like, wait, something is happening in Bayview. People care about this idea. They've you know, bootstrapped it as far as they can. We should get our people who, who work on green space or that prioritize that area to go talk with them and figure out, can we help them along? Can we get them to the next stage? Can we take this off their hands and make it a public service? Does that, does that make sense? Very active, very well networked treatment groups who would 
Yeah, really hard to quantify, but I think great question. Um, I feel like they add the most value in terms of bringing in a new type of donor. Um, you know, I think, you know, a lot of nonprofits are like, why on earth do we need this? You know, we've been raising money for centuries. Well, you know, most of us probably don't give to charity all that much um, through just putting money in a hat. The reason is it's not exciting. Um, it's not engaging. When you are part of a crowdfunding campaign, what's really different, and to me the value add is the mutual visibility. It's like, I'm giving, and I know that you gave, and I know that she gave, and we feel part of, of this group. Um, and that's non-trivial in my view. You know, that building of belonging and of community is incredibly powerful. And I think that, unfortunately, the nonprofit sector um, has moved away from going after small donors because to them the ROI is not good enough. As somebody from a very big nonprofit in San Francisco said to me, why would I spend three months and five staff members time to raise 20 grand when I can make one phone call or hold a gala and raise $2 million. And even if the ROI looks good, wait a second, who are all those potential donors that we're missing? Like, there's, there's something clearly missing there, and that's the attention to the interest and responsibility that we all have to contribute to these projects. We want to, but we're just not being given the opportunity, and I think that is the value add that crowdfunding is providing. Just, just related to that, sorry, very quickly. So when yeah. I Um, I found that with the small campaigns, the small scale ones like sub $5,000, it's almost all individual donations. When you get to the big ones, uh, a couple of the ones I highlighted, you, I would say often you have 50 or 60% is coming from large donors. But large donors aren't interested, you have another scale problem. Large donors are not interested in $5,000 community gardens. They're like, so what? Um, Unless it's in their community. Right. And unless, you know, it's a supermarket who really wants to get planning permission for that site that's disputed, and if they back a bunch of community gardens, they might, they might be looked upon more favorably. So my question, Rebecca, you talked a lot about um, preventive care for like social ills, but I wonder why more um, isn't done on preventive maintenance for our like, art infrastructure. You know, when we were tuned to receive F grade from civil engineers on our bridges and roads, and we can very easily fix that by financing it, uh, the kind of preventive maintenance. Why is it more money raised this way through, uh, for preventive maintenance of heart? It's a totally good question. Um, and I think that the, the, I mean, to some extent, you get to the same issue of, of a zero, like a overall pot of resources that is basically, it's we spend a lot of money on the disasters and on the things, you know, once that infrastructure fails, um, it, or once our, you know, once people are needing really expensive services. Um, and so making that shift to invest up front, I think is, is really hard, but you're totally right. Although I don't think that necessarily, you could use a tool like this. I mean, I think that what I love about a pay for success type approach it's sort of like low-income housing tax credits or other tools that exist in other places where you're basically saying there will be there will be some recovery or some cost savings or some revenues down the line and we're financing against that and that's really different than a general obligation bond that's basically based on the taxes that are collected so mm -hmm. I think it's a good point so I think we are approaching the end of our session and I'm going to um, wrap up with one last question and why you guys to all think about 10 years into the future. It's 2024 um, In one sentence, can you summarize what your vision is for the landscape of civic funding 10 years from now? In one sentence, yes <laughs> I used to have a real job um, Can we stream of consciousness, phrase? I would say uh, disintermediated, disaggregated, 
and democratized. Oh, literally. like haiku and <laughs> <laughs> sentence. <laughs> I just learned the letter D. I, I'm a fan. I, I, like, I like how it works. I would say a long menu of ways large and small to push and pull on government. Yeah. Um, better utilization of data and integration of it so that um, real costs and values can be effectively priced in the marketplace and financed again. So I know there are folks who didn't get to ask all their questions. Feel free to come up, and I just want to thank everyone for your time.